Okay, guys, so I hope you're having a good day and that you can see this. This is Dr. Edwards, and I wanted to go over this week's chapter with everyone. I hope that you can see this, but if you can't, please let me know. But this chapter is focused on defining communication as an element of culture. So that basically means it will define what intercultural communication or what communication is at, within the context of a of a culture. So remember, a culture can be a group of people that share a commonality. So say if you have a group of, and it's a larger group, but a group of all women or all men or all members of the GLBT community, that would be considered in that context a culture. So hi, I hope you guys can see, you can hear me. Um, I'm not sure if it's recording, but Chris just joined. So apparently it's working, hopefully. But a culture is basically a group of people who share a commonality. Okay, so let's dive into it. Okay, so there are four intercultural communication skill areas. So that basically means the way that you view yourself is your self-concept. And you guys have heard that a lot. Hey, Kyla, you guys have heard that a lot. So the way that we view ourselves, whether it's positive or negative or a neutral self-concept, that is the way that you view yourself in a given circumstance. Then you also have this thing called self-disclosure. That's how much you're willing to reveal about yourself. And so if any of you have ever seen Shrek, that is almost, uh, and I think it's Shrek 1, but he talks about himself as an onion and how it, he peels back the layers in order to reveal certain things about himself to other people. So it's, it's peeling back those layers when we meet someone. Um, it's very important because you want to make sure that you're on the same page with them and that they know a little bit more about you. And if they know a little bit more about you, they're more likely to feel closer to you and also to tell you more about themselves as well. Okay. Also self-monitoring. It is basically figuring out especially those of you who have traveled outside of the country or you speak with a, a group you're not normally um, conversing with within the country. It's really neat to know about, hi guys, it's really neat to know about self-monitoring because you can see exactly if you want to disclose more, disclose less, if you want to give more facial expressions, less facial expressions. So it's basically figuring out how the people are receiving your communication and whether that's positive or negative, and then controlling the way that we communicate with them. So let me give you an example. When I go home, I'm from East Texas, but East Texas is a culture unto itself. <laughs> and so when I go home, I actually um, communicate with people from back home. If I spoke the same way that I, I am speaking right now, they would, um, would rate me very low on the um, self-disclosure scale because they think that they would think that I would be less willing to reveal certain things about myself um, if I spoke in this manner. But I have to speak in a very relaxed tone to people back home. And I, um, I have to practice that, that self-monitoring because you want to make sure that you communicate with your audience effectively and you make sure that your message gets across. And if you need me to explain that a little bit more, I can. Also, so social relaxation is basically how relaxed you are around different groups of people. So um, for example, when I go to Mexico, I'm not as relaxed as I am here. Or when I go to Canada, I'm not as relaxed as I am in the States or in Texas or in Stephenville because I there's certain rules and regulations and laws that I don't know. So I'm less relaxed um, than there than I am here. So those are the four intercultural competence skill areas. And if you guys have any questions about those, just type them in the box if you're in the Zoom link. And also if you are on Twitter, I will see your tweets when they come across as well. Okay, so also let's move on to communication skills. Behavioral flexibility basically means how do you modify, modify your behavior when you're communicating with different types of people. So if I'm communicating with my six-year-old, I am going to communicate in a different style to the six-year-old or the, you know, the first grader culture, which is very interesting when compared to communicating with my 73-year-old father. So your behavioral flexibility will also influence your um, communication with people of different race and races of different ethnicities, etc. Also, interaction management is a little bit 
it, it's very close to self-monitoring, but interaction management basically means how you want to interact with a person of a different culture or a person who is similar or very dissimilar to, to yourself. So the way that you interact with people is very um, important. And so um, I will actually tell you guys the way that I communicate with people my own age is very different than communicating with people um, that are significantly older or significantly younger than I am. But I manage my interaction accordingly. And also sometimes I will speak very loudly. Sometimes I will speak very softly. Sometimes I want to, to make sure that I am able to fit within that communication realm. All right. So also social skills. It's very important as well. We're in the South right now. So social skills, especially when um, you're communicating with someone who has been in the South for a while. My family has been in the South for five generations. My little one's a sixth generation Texan. But um, the social skills that we have to master as Texans are very different than our peers in other, sometimes in other states. Um, so when I communicate with my cousins and friends from California or from um, Boston, it's it's very different than the way that I would communicate with people um, normally in Texas. So, you know, in Texas, we sometimes we say, bless your heart. And if we talk um, in that way with people from maybe the East Coast or West Coast, they possibly would not know the reason that we're saying that. So it's very, very interesting. So, but social skills and social norms are very important as well. And if you guys have any that I've missed or that I do not know about social skills, especially in the South, please contribute those. I would love to see them. Okay, psychological adjustment. Basically, it's acclimating yourself to a new environment. And so when you go to a new state or to a new country, or even when you're transitioning from high school to college, which are two different cultures, you have to acclimate yourself to your new environment. So that's why we have such things as Transition Week at Tarleton, because we want to make sure that people transition to Tarleton um, more effectively than they would if we just threw them into, um, I was a transfer student, but, you know, I was thrown into the, hey, you're a college student, you know, at a four-year university now instead of your community college, which is difficult sometimes, but that psychological adjustment is part of that acclimation piece. Okay, let's see. Oops. Okay, so I'm going back for a second, hopefully. Oh, there we are. Okay, so also cultural awareness. So these are the elements of the intercultural communication competence theory. And these are very important. And let me tell you why. If you are able to master intercultural sensitivity, awareness, and adroitness, then you will be rated very high on the intercultural communication competence scale. That basically means that you are able to communicate with people more effectively than your counterparts, which is great for jobs, for the workplace, for your family, etc. So if you're able to be sensitive to other people, to be aware of how they are um, different or, or, or similar to your own culture and whether or not your message um, gets across in an effective manner, that's very important. So let's go over all three of these. Intercultural sensitivity, well, let me start with awareness. Intercultural awareness basically means that you are aware of your own cultural identity and then also the cultural ident identities of others. So that basically means that I am an African-American woman I am in my 30s, y'all. <laughs> I'm in my 30s, but I'm aware of my cultural identity um, as it is similar or dissimilar similar than other people. I um, So I am sensitive to my communication with people who are not women, who are not African-American, and also who are not in their 30s, because I can say specific things that can help me relate to, to them, which is very important to make sure that you're on the same page. Also, um, Intercultural adroitness basically means that you're taking into account the awareness of your own culture and the cultures of others, how sensitive to, are you to the differences, and if you're able to adapt, to adapt to those differences. And also adroitness basically means, are you able to communicate effectively and, and make sure your, your behavior is, is flexible when you're communicating with people who are not like you. So that's important. And if you're able to master that, then you have um, effectively addressed intercultural communication competence. And I hope that that makes sense, guys. I'm used to a, um, a screen. So if I, hopefully you guys have Twitter up as well, so I can respond on, on Twitter as well. Okay. So four ethical principles to guide intercultural um, intercultural interactions basically means to address other people with the same respect that you would like to, uh, to have. Also, describe the world as you 
perceive it and then also as accurately as possible. So basically you will give what is true to you. That basically means if I state that, um, oh goodness, let me give you a simple one. Okay, if I am interacting with a group of people and I state that living as a woman in the workplace sometimes um, is difficult when communicating with my male counterparts about, you know, golf or basketball or, um, well, basketball season is my season, so I'll just admit that I love basketball, but golf or basketball or football, when they, um, you know, talk about the game on, on Sunday night, I can't relate. So, you know, if I tell other people that, you know, I, I like I like sports, but sports aren't my thing. I am describing the world as I perceive it according to my culture and who I am. Um, that's not saying that all women do not like sports. I love basketball, by the way. But it's basically um, telling people your truth, your personal truth. Um, and also, for example, keeping into account that sports communication piece that we just talked about, encouraging other peoples of other cultures to express themselves and their own uniqueness, that's important because you're like, I don't like football, but maybe you like football. Maybe you can help me understand the game a little bit better. So that's encouraging them, even though they are of, the, of a culture that likes football, um, generally, they are able to express um, themselves through, you know, talking about the game and then I'll talk about, you know, some different things that I understand about football. So maybe we can meet on the same page. And then also identification with people from other cultures. That's very, very important because when you communicate and identify with people from other cultures, then you can also express your culture uh, as well. So I am a Texan. When I communicate with people from Louisiana, I can talk about those pine trees. I'm from East Texas, so we have a lot of pine trees. So I can talk about those pine trees. I can also talk about the fact that I love crawfish etouffee if you have not had it. Um, crawfish season, I think, is coming up, but it's very good. So I can identify in that sense. But to find those commonalities whenever you're, com when you're communicating with people is super important. Okay, so um, Confucian principles of communication or on communication, um, just transitioning a little bit, but basically you have um, five relationships. You have the ruler and the subjects, which is basically the person who makes the rules or the, the leader and the people who um, they that the people who are being led. Also, you have a husband and wife. You have a romantic-based relationship. You have a father-son, which is a functional family relationship. And then you have an el a potentially an elder brother, younger sister. That is a um, order-based relationship. So someone is younger and someone is, sorry, elder brother, young, younger brother. That is a high, high hierarchy in some families that the elder brother makes decisions and the younger, younger brother, you know, follows suit. And then also you have the friend and friend. So those are different dynamics that take place whenever communication can happen. And that these principles differ by culture. I'll just throw that out there as well. So um, Confucian principles on communication, just so you guys know, um, it's different per country. So um, and some cultures, particularism basically means that there are no universal patterns of rules governing relationships. So that means um, if you are in the U.S. and you walk up to someone and you're like, hi, my name is, you know, Beth. And if they introduce themselves as well, and then they ask you, how old are you? In the U.S., that would be a taboo conversation because especially um, among some men and some women because they don't want to disclose their age. But in Korea, that might be the second thing that people would ask. But then the U.S., we're basically like, here's my name. And then also, uh, you know, what do you do? Where are you from? But in Korea, age might um, supersede those, you know, roles or, you know, where are the geographic region that you're from. So it's important to know that different countries have different roles. Also the roles of intermediaries. And so this is important. Um, whenever you had those intermediaries, um, it's important to know that the people who <laughs> are in those conversations sometimes do not want to to offend people so they'll hire these people to negotiate on their behalf so um for example if you're getting married and you want to have a prenup but your partner does not necessarily want to have a prenup then you would hire a negotiator to help you negotiate through that process or if you um 
have a situation where you want to, well, and we do this in the U.S. as well, where we want to purchase a property or purchase a vehicle, then you might have a person to serve as an intermediary to help you through that process. So goodness, I guess I a few slides. Also, we have reciprocity. That basically means if I do this, you do that. So there are complementary obligations that people do um, during in a culture. So for example, um, if you are getting ready to get married, you know, the um, in some countries, the wife's family will give the husband's family a, a cow or or another token of monetary appreciation. So to know what is perceived as reciprocity in a, in a different country or within a different culture. Also in-group, out-group distinction. So um, with cultures, sometimes you have people who are in, in the in-group and sometimes you will have people who are in the out-group and there will be a distinction that basically draws the line between group one and group two. So for example, in the U.S., um, and even in our political structure, we have the majority and we have the um, minority when it comes to the, you know, the people who have control of the House or the Senate. So it's important to know, um, you know, what those, up, like basically who's the end group, who's the out group per legislative session or per, um, you know, what it looks like on a state or a national level. So you have the end group and then out group distinction. And they make it very plain within our legislate, legislature so that you know who has more control, who has less control. Also, um, overlap of personal public relationships. That's something that we struggle with in the U.S. Um, sometimes people want to, oh, and I'll just tell you, the people who are like 40, 50, 60, and above who are in the workplace, um, they like to have that personal public relationship um, are basically they want to make sure that there is no overlap between home life and work life, but then people who are like 30s and um, 20s and in the teens, they like to have that overlap of personal and also public um, relationships. So it's just very interesting to see what people um, value and how they um, want to communicate with other folks. Um, also, in some cultures, you might have language that is honorific, and then you have familiar language. So honorific language basically can go from very, you know, very formal to less formal to um, very informal. And then familiar basically means you're using the same language no matter the rank of the person that you're speaking with. So um, I hope that makes sense. So if you are speaking with, like, say, President Dantavio or um, the governor of our state, um, and you want to tell those individuals about something, you will probably not use slang. Um, you will probably use very familiar language, but, and, um, excuse me, you would probably use less familiar language. You would probably use more polite um, or honorific language. And I know all of you guys have seen the communication model before, like the sender, the receiver, the message, the noise, etc. Okay. Also, we have um, the media in intercultural communication. So there are some some interesting things that happen in the U.S. that do not happen in other countries. So in the U.S., we have great concern for privacy and autonomy. So that basically means we want to have negotiation face to face. We will. Um, you know, make sure that if we disagree with something, our court system is set up that we have that face-to-face -face communication with the person or group of people um, with whom we disagree. But also we have to, we express more self-faced maintenance. And that basically means we could blatantly disagree with someone, but we will not let that show on our face necessarily. Um, also that link, hopefully it still works, but that link is based on landlines versus cell phones. So landlines, you are um, tied to a certain location and that I'm sure does a communication barrier sometimes. And then with cell phones, you can speak with anyone anywhere at any time. So that's another um, piece that has really rocked our intercultural communication patterns because sometimes, you know, like Chick-fil-A right now has like this chicken coop and it basically says that you put your phones in the coop and the first one to, you know, cause we always check our phones or maybe that's me, but we, if you take your phone out, out of the coop, then you have to pay for everyone's meal next time, I think. But, um, that wasn't even a thing even 20, 15 years ago. So, well, maybe it was 15 years ago. I had a cell phone 15 years ago. But anyway, 
the, that wasn't even a thing maybe 25 years ago to take your, your cell phone out of that or to check it every few minutes. So that, you know, especially when we're speaking with someone who does not have a cell phone or maybe they're in their 70s or 80s. I mean, I know people who are in their 70s and 80s who have a cell phone, but it's important to know how that could negatively impact that communication. Okay, also design elements within the internet. Um, cultural differences are the same in the virtual world. So you might have a country that uses a lot of colors on the website or less pictures than another country. So that's important to keep in mind. And also um, even with YouTube, the YouTube um, links are, are, the YouTube graphics are very different per country. Okay, so, um, it's interesting, but just hearing, we're, we're talking about prejudice and racism. Prejudice basically means you're prejudging someone based on something that you, basically they exhibit a characteristic um, of someone else that you know of that group, and therefore we are prejudging the way that they will think, act, or believe. Racism is basically placing everyone in an inflexible category. So prejudice, you can, you can prejudge someone and then, you know, step back from your judgment and then be friends and work together and live harmoniously. But with racism, it's less likely to change because, um, you know, you are placing everyone in an inflexible category because of their race. And so race usually are uh, race in the U S and in difference per country, but in the U S it's basically, um, if you're looking at race, those are mostly going to be color-based words. So yellow, white, black, brown, red. So um, there are five races, um, generally, races in the U.S. And so um, keep those two in mind because you will see the, those again, I'll just tell you. But just hearing racist or prejudiced comments can negatively affect how the listener evaluates the individual who's the topic of the conversation. So if you are a kid or an adult and you're listening to overhearing a conversation um, about someone of another race or someone who has a disability or whatever, then um, that can negatively affect the individual who's listening um, either directly or indirectly, whether they're listening in the conversation or whether they're listening from another table, because I do that too, guys. Um, they can negatively judge the topic of, of the individual who's the topic of the conversation. And also to keep in mind, hate speech. So hate speech is defined as spoken or verbal slurs directed against a group of people. So, um, and remember, groups of people comprise a culture and every culture has hate, has hate speech that can be associated with it. So whether it's male, female, white, black, brown, etc., I want you guys to know that hate speech is present everywhere. So young, old, there, there is hate speech that can be um, delivered per group. And last but not least, um, it's interesting, but on the internet, anyone can be a troll. And that basically means that people can basically... <laughs> Because you don't see the person that you're interacting with, people are more likely to disclose those layers of themselves without a filter. So that can get people in trouble sometimes, but it can add an immediacy to, pre to prejudice and racism. And that basically means people are talking without a filter. Therefore, they could possibly be contributing more to a race, racial or ethnic or hate speech situation than they would in a face-to-face -face environment. People have a lot of um, courage over the internet. Okay, also, and that comes from every, every, um, every <laughs> culture. Also, the study of intercultural communication originated in 1946 with the Foreign Service Act. And so that is when this whole field of communication came about. And then also um, JFK or John F. Kennedy basically created the Peace Corps in the early 1960s to basically serve as, um, as a diplomatic, hey, go to another country, um, you know, work with the people of that country, show them how great the U.S. is and how we are wanting to work with their country and to make everything and better. So basically, that's the Peace Corps. Still happens today. You guys can still take advantage of it if you guys want to do it. And when I get older, I'm actually going to do the older form of Peace Corps where you go to a different country, you live there, and um, it's a great opportunity. But that as a result of the Foreign Service Act, then the Peace Corps came about as well. But it's a great way of, of showing um, international diplomacy. And I'm not sure if that 
is actually present in other countries as well. So for example, does the does England have their version of Peace Corps? Not sure. Okay, so um, peace is the fundamental human value according to Kale 1997. And then also four ethical principles of intercultural interactions. You want to treat people with the same um, you know, respect that you would like to receive. These are the ones that we had before, but I just want to reiterate this for, um, for you guys as well. Describe the world according to your truth, and then also encourage other people to describe the world according to their truth, and also find some area of commonality. Okay, and we are moving along. Okay, and the language and the ethics of prejudice and racism. So communication can spread a role in spreading justice or racism or stopping their spread. And I want you guys to think about that. Um, just um, something extra that you guys could do. Just let me know um, what you think about that. Can, cult can communication play a role in spreading justice, racism, or stopping the spread of justice and racism? Let me know. Also. Um, We'll skip down to othering or the language and ethics of othering. Basically, the labeling and degrading of cultures and groups that are not your own is, pot is potentially an other category. And let's bring it home for you guys. You guys are all in college. I would possibly say that 12%, or maybe around 12, 20% of the people that are your age are in college, no matter what age you are. Um, have a college education or um, have been just exposed to college. So I want to tell you guys that people who are not in college sometimes experience the other side of othering. So that means when we are in situations, whether at church or whether or if you go to church or whether at Walmart or, or, or even at a restaurant and you're talking about, you know, well, in college I did this or that, that is automatically potentially excluding or othering um, organization or other people who did not have that experience yet. So um, the labeling or degrading other cultures and groups outside of your own, maybe um, I've seen um, it in the workplace where people do not have the education that some other people do, and they will degrade the people who do not have that level of education, which I think is definitely wrong. But it goes back to finding that commonality between um, your group and another group and talk about the things that you guys have in common. Also Nazi propaganda. That's another piece that um, has that basically it was an entire movement focused on othering that one group was not as good as the other group that um, one group is better than the other group. So it's, it's important. It's an important thing to keep in mind. that's happened in every country. Every country has a um, history of othering. And also, um, it, <laughs> it revolutionized the U.S. census. And so we can actually, in some countries, I think France does not have a census, if I'm not mistaken. It, maybe as of two years ago, they have a census, but they do not have a census. So they actually do not know um, how many people of X, Y, and Z culture exist in their country. But I'll have to look that up just in case that you've changed it in the past couple of years. But um, with the U.S. Census, you can actually see how many people represent X, Y, and Z race or ethnicity or another country in the U.S. Um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Okay. Also, we have um, intercultural communication competence. There are three skill areas, which are very important. Um, you have the maintenance of self. So basically, you can reduce your stress by knowing about a different culture. And we'll talk about that um, throughout the course, because I know you guys are going to go into the workplace or whether you're there right now. And it's a great way to, uh, to basically minimize your anxiety when you're interacting with people who are not like yourself. Also, um, the fostering of relationships with different people that we, um, it says host, but different people that we communicate with who are not of your culture. And then also you can um, correctly perceive the host environment. So if everyone is sitting um, on the floor, eating their food with their fingers, the percept correct perception in that um, context would basically mean you need to sit on the floor and eat with your fingers. So instead of saying, oh, is there a fork? Or this country is not good because they do not have forks. So we'll talk about that. That's something called ethnocentrism, which is one of my favorite words ever. But basically that's saying that all cultures need to act like your culture um, or they're wrong because they do not act like your culture. 
so we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I just wanted to throw that in. But last but not least, um, there are eight skill areas. So some of those are self-awareness, self-respect, interaction, and also um, avoiding hate speech. And then also personality strength, communication skills, psychological adjustment, and also cultural awareness. And those are very important as well to know. Um, one thing that I have not mentioned today is culture shock. Um, because you guys have seen these eight skill areas um, throughout the presentation, but culture shock basically means when we go to a different country or a different area of our state, or if we're raised in a rural environment and travel to the city or vice versa, you're able to handle and effectively communicate in a culture shock situation. Um, it's unavoidable, but um, I'll just say even when I travel to my hometown and I do that a few times a month, I, there is not a Starbucks there we used to only have 3g so they didn't have 4g most of the households there do not have um, high-speed internet so they're still using dial-up so they're able to handle cult i'm able to handle cult culture shock now because i know if i want to use the internet i have to go to mcdonald's or um you know those kind of things so culture shock is basically when you're able to when you know that something is not like your own and sometimes that makes you a little bit uneasy, but you're able to handle it by communicating or um, handling certain things within that situation. Okay, and that's it. I am actually going to see if we have any questions. Chat, let's see. Okay, no questions. But if you have any questions moving forward, please let me know. I'm super excited that you're in the course this semester. I want to help you guys succeed. And you guys will definitely apply what we've talked about in class to, you can even apply it this week, guys, but to your um, current and also your future job. And I will speak with you guys a little bit later. But this is Dr. Jennifer Edwards at DRJT, <laughs> DRJT Edwards, signing off. And I hope you guys are having a great day.